Carla Giugino is intoxicating. Literally just intoxicating from the moment she steps on screen. She's the most gorgeous woman and so incredibly talented. Hey everyone, welcome back to Candid Cinema. I'm Amanda, otherwise known as AMX NDA Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Today I will be reviewing The Fall of the House of Usher, created by Mike Flanagan for Netflix. This is actually his like final send-off from the streaming service, and oh my god, it is some of his best work to date. It is possibly like top three for me. It's just brilliant from beginning to end and now i wanted to wait a bit to uh review this because there's so much to talk about in this series and i wanted to do a full spoiler review uh, i do want to thank netflix for sending me the episodes ahead of time i sat there for eight hours straight and i had binged this i haven't done that in a very long time just to sit there and binge something like straight through it's been a while that a television series has been so engaging like the fall of the house of usher so first i want to say that this is incredibly well structured and the reason why i fell in love with this from the very beginning is that they use edgar Allan poe's fall of the house of usher short story as the overarching story so you have the usher family and everything started with Roderick and Madeline. Roderick is played phenomenally by Bruce Greenwood. And then Mary McDonald plays Madeline Usher. So the two of them start out and they had a really tough childhood. They had to witness their mother go a bit mad. There was a specific kind of uh, condition that they didn't know what to do with her and they ended up burying her alive because they thought that she had passed in the backyard. So that's the first sense of creepiness and the emotional tie to their mother, right? So these kids had to watch that happen. They had to scramble at a young age. They see that she didn't die, but she had some unfinished business with her boss because she was a secretary at Fortunato. So slowly the story unfolds. With that, there are flashbacks going back and forth because Roderick, present day Roderick, has to confess everything, everything that's ever happened in his life <laughs> to attorney Dupin, who is played by Carl Lumbly. The two of them open up this first episode and they sit there with this bottle of cognac and there are creepy things happening around them. But each episode there is a different confession. There's a different story. There's a different child being discussed. So the Usher family has had a tragic, tragic thing happen to them where every single one of the children of Roderick's children dies. They are murdered. They have no idea what had happened. There's a very tangled web that they weave. We find out that Roderick and Madeline's mother was canoodling with Griswold from Fortunato and that he's in fact their dad. They technically are the heirs to the company of Fortunato, but it doesn't work out for them that way. We see in these flashbacks that Roderick and Madeline kind of have to fight their way into the company, which doesn't make any sense, but they are technically seen as bastard children. So Roderick has two legitimate children with his wife, Annabelle Lee. And then he has bastard children all over the country, basically. But he welcomes them in because he wants to be known as their father. Each episode has a different kill. Each episode ties into the overarching story. And each one has a form of Edgar Allan Poe's poems, has his prose, worked into the dialogue. And you also have episode titles that have the short story names as well. You have character names like Annabelle Lee, very famous poem. All of that is worked in here. So what I found incredible was that even the episode structure, you have a flashback to the 70s when they were trying to break into Fortunato. And then you have present day of Roderick telling Dupin everything that's happening with the ghosts of the children haunting their father. And then they have a flashback to how they were murdered. So I think that structurally, it is very intricate work here. It's dark and gothic. It's 
gothic horror as Edgar Allan Poe is known for. And Flanagan's possibly one of the few directors that knows how to do that and capture it visually and tell the story. But specifically this one, I think he modernized it. A lot of people have been saying it's kind of like Succession, but like a horror version of Succession. And I really like that. But each episode you have a kill. So if we're talking about Flanagan and the scares and trying to create like a very eerie atmosphere and very harsh images, like they're very graphic. But at this point, I'm not as scared. And I think a lot of people can just have an appreciation for what Flanagan does, especially with the makeup and the blood and just conceptually how each murder was tied into the decisions the children had made, the business decisions that they had made. And I think that it all comes back to the deal that Roderick and Madeline made. Now, this is obviously a spoiler review. This happens at the very end. We find out what happens in episode eight. Blew my mind. Absolutely brilliant. So those decisions, the decisions humans make, obviously set you down a specific path. And one New Year's Eve, they meet this woman named Verna, who is a bartender who's played by the lovely, lovely, lovely Carla Gugino. And she just has this casual conversation with Madeline, with Roderick, questioning them. Do you have a resolution for the new year? What are you? What have you guys been doing tonight? What are your goals? What do you want in life? And she's so incredibly inviting. She has this beautiful, beautiful smile that is so loving, but at the same time, there's something behind it. Even in her eyes, she's just menacing at the same time. She is an incredible actress and it, this one really shows her range and verna tells them you know let's let's make a deal let's make a deal because roderick and madeline had killed griswold the night of new year's eve had poisoned him after drinking i think a glass of sherry they poisoned him and they placed him behind a brick wall which was amazing because the opening song and the closing song for the fall of the house of usher is another brick in the wall by pink floyd brilliant we don't know what the brick wall was throughout the entire thing but all we heard was a jingling like a court jester jingling and it turns out that he was wearing that mask the night of new year's eve and he was buried with that mask so all these little things were tied together because verna made them a deal as I was saying, she said that I will give you all the fortune that you want. No one will remember this day. No one will remember that Griswold died. But your children, your bloodline will die. They will live a fruitful life, but they will die when you are close to death. She told Roderick and Madeline in the, I think it was like 81 or 82. That's what she said to them. So obviously they're like, we get to be rich. We get to live like kings and queens and pass that down to our children without anything going wrong. Of course, we're going to do that. They took the deal and they could not remember what happened that night. Madeline couldn't remember. Roderick couldn't remember. So in each episode, Verna appears. We know. The audience knows that it's Verna because of what happens in that first episode. Verna plants herself in the lives of Roderick's kids. So the youngest, Perry, he dies first in the second episode because he throws this like sex rave and he really wants to prove himself to his father. He really just wants to be the one that makes it on his own because Roderick gives all this money to them because he wants to extend the business. Has nothing to do with bonding with his kids. It's extending the business, his legacy, without even knowing that this is going to happen because he forgot he made that deal. So there comes a time in Verna's path for them that something has to go wrong. So Dupin, the attorney who's been trying to bust Roderick for the longest time, says that there's an informant among the kids, among his family, that has been leaking information to him and he knows so much, but he can't reveal who the informant is. Family comes together. This is when everything starts to happen because now the kids aren't really loving towards one another. They don't really care about each other because they're not they're all bastards except for tammy and frederick who are the oldest but the rest of them are technically bastard children so they do not see eye to eye and they could go after each other they're trying to figure out who the informant is here and they think that it's perry because he's the youngest and then the audience thinks that it's perry too until we see verna and we know the exact cause of everything verna appears on the top of this building that Perry wants to have this rave at. And it's just small 
pieces of dialogue where, you know, Perry didn't check the water tank because who cares about checking the water tank? It's not like we have to have permits or we don't have to do any of that. It's fine. It'll be okay. We can turn the water on instead of trying to filter the water into the drinks and all of that stuff later on at midnight and just have it rain and have this fantastic party. Verna shows up. Carla Giugino's intoxicating. Literally just intoxicating from the moment she steps on screen. She's the most gorgeous woman and so incredibly talented that she tries to change Perry's mind. She does this with each kid in each episode. And then when the water falls at midnight and she warns specific people to get out of there because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, instead of water falling from the sprinklers, acid falls from the sprinklers. That's episode two. Third episode has Camille going in, who's played by Kate Siegel wonderfully. She goes into her dad's other corp where her sister Vic, played by Tania Miller, is testing on monkeys in order to place like a heart monitor on them and then save them for like irregular heartbeats. And they're using the specific medicine on them as well. And they can't test on humans yet, but they're just like rapid fire. They're trying to get to those human trials, but they're testing on monkeys. So Camille goes into this building. She sees that there's a security guard there. It's Verna. She tells her, you do not need to be here. You can go. Camille doesn't listen, goes in, gets completely brutalized by the monkey. And Verna's in the body of the monkey. So I thought that was an incredible kill as well. You see the kids mutilated, essentially, right before their death at the end of the episode. So there are millions of components in each episode. And I think that the way everything connected towards the end was absolutely brilliant. It was not confusing. It was very straightforward. You go to episode four and, and Napoleon, whose nickname Leo is played by Raul Coley. He goes mad because he accidentally kills his boyfriend's cat because he was on heavy drugs. He tries to go find another one sees Verna at the pet store. She gives him a very specific black cat. The cat terrorizes him. He rips the apartment apart and then he ends up getting his eye scratched. He's getting, he's bloodied all over because of this cat. And once he sees that the cat's on, on the railing of the balcony in his apartment, he runs towards the cat and then he flips off the balcony and dies. Vic's death was like absolutely brutal. One of the worst ones I'd seen because... Verna goes to her and says that she can be a human tester and that she's ready to, you know, fix her heart and do all of that. She was very sincere. Carla Giugino was changing left, right, and center. Every single person that she became was incredible and worked so well. She had to change the tide with each of the kids. So she would be very sweet and understanding. And then there would be that point in time where it's like, well, I told you not to make this decision. And then she goes on to tell them how wrong they've been living and what they're doing is so incredibly wrong. So then in episode six, Tammy gets it, which is the second oldest. It's the daughter of Annabelle Lee. And she had a very interesting relationship with her husband. They would never have any sexual intimacy. Instead, Tammy would hire someone who kind of looks like her to sit down at the dinner table and, you know, converse with her husband and then engage in sexual acts as well while she watched. And it was a specific contract that she had with her husband and it was very odd, but there wasn't enough of Tammy in the rest of the episode. So once we get to her episode, Samantha Sloyan is incredible because she wasn't confident in herself because of her father. She just wanted to constantly prove herself. So she had another person. She needed another person to play her because she was just mentally exhausted of trying to be who she was. And that's that's really, really hard mentally to want to be somebody else and have somebody else do things that normally you would be able to do, but you're just so exhausted with pushing and pushing forward in this business. So I loved that episode because there were mirrors used with Verna in the mirror as Tammy's body double, but we're seeing Verna and Tammy still psychologically is seeing herself and seeing that Verna had taken over her body, which is insane. So the mirrors were so cool. The lighting in this episode was great. And you have these broken mirrors, broken pieces, fragments of Tammy all over the place. And that's how she dies. She takes one golf club to the mirror above their bed and then all the shards of glass just pierce right through her. Amazing, amazing. So lastly, we have Frederick who dies 
and Henry Thomas. The man is incredible. He scares me, but he's just so good at what he does. So beyond good at what he does. So from the very beginning, we see a very different Frederick. Okay, Frederick is the eldest. He's the oldest one out of the entire family. He's technically, you know, he's the firstborn son of Roderick Usher. So he has a different air about him, but he's not really business savvy. He's only top dog because of his age. And he goes on a downward spiral from the very beginning to the end because of what Perry does to Frederick. Frederick can't stand the youngest. The youngest can't stand the oldest. So Perry invites Morella, who's played by Crystal Ballant. So he invites her to the rave, which is weird. It's your sister-in-law. Why are you going? And she goes. She goes. She's one of the people that are in there. And she's one of the people that Verna says, you gotta go. You gotta get out of here. So Frederick didn't really know that she went he is completely broken up the fact that he finds out that she lied to him, especially after the acid does drop all over Morella. The acid drops on Morella. She's burnt to a crisp, but she is also the only survivor, which I think Verna did on purpose. So you see that Morella is all bandaged up. She has zero information. And now their daughter, Lenore, who's played by Kylie Curran and starred in Doctor Sleep, I love her so much, I'm so happy Flanagan used her again, is questioning her father. Why aren't there doctors here? Why aren't there specialists here? You literally forced her to get out of the hospital and go back to our house. Why would you do this? So, because he finds out that she went, she ends up getting mutilated because he tortures her there doesn't give her medicine, doesn't help her out, gives her too much medicine, gives her the same medicine that Vic is using on the monkeys. So he's doing that to her. So Frederick goes to Napoleon. He's like, I need to take the edge off, takes cocaine. Now the cocaine and the medicine that he was giving Morella are kind of on the same table when he takes them. Verna shows up, wipes his mind a bit while he's on a phone call and he accidentally puts the drug in the cocaine and he put more than what he had initially wanted to take. So she basically poisoned him and she's like, not yet, we can't have him die yet. Verna takes him to the building, which he should have had demolished before the rave. And she makes him take the cocaine and he is lying down on the ground now, completely paralyzed. And you know, one of those swinging axes? Yeah, that's what's coming through the building because being demolished. And she just lies there with him, telling him the mistake that he made. All the mistakes that he made in his life led him to this point. And then that is how Frederick dies, a slow death with the blade and the poison in his system. All of this is amazing because Verna appears in the episode before to certain characters. So you know that something is brewing. Nothing feels rushed here. The pacing for these eight episodes absolutely incredible. It's dark. It's twisted. You have these characters that have all gone through some horrible, horrible thing in their life, and they still continue to make poor decisions. Now, Roderick made the worst decision of all in creating a painkiller called Ligodone for Fortunato, and he knew that these painkillers were addictive, even though he sold them as non-addictive painkillers. People were overdosing, people were dying, and that's the reason why Dupin, Carl Lumbly, wanted to nail him, wanted to bring him to court and arrest him because he has killed thousands upon thousands of people. So Roderick and Madeline were so concerned about legacy. What legacy do they leave behind? Now, Madeline had no recollection of that night, but she didn't want to have children. She was a feminist in the 70s. She didn't want men to treat her a certain way. She developed a technology, an algorithm that would keep people alive through AI technology and they would stay forever, which, you know, it's getting there. So it's crazy. But she developed this algorithm, very organized. No man wanted to hear her until that very night that she killed Griswold herself and became COO of Fortunato. So they did become the rightful, you know, pairing to lead Fortunato, to be on the board of Fortunato, but at what price? So the final episode, every single thing is tied together. You have music cues, you have specific noises, you have very bold imagery of the raven as Verna, symbolizes Verna. You have the court gesture mask appearing in the limo and they keep going back to that point because they didn't want to see it. You see the children and you see Verna, you see his wife, Annabelle Lee, at the funeral, bits and pieces. It's a bit disjointed. The editing is so strong in this because you're seeing fragments of what Roderick is telling 
Dupin. These images are important because you're stacking them together. So we can remember at the very beginning what we saw. Flanagan laid it out for us in the first episode. Those images were burned in our brain. The raven, Verna, the brick wall, the song being stuck in our head, the little jangling of the court jester mask. All of that was present throughout the entire series. All you need is those little things subtly placed. And then in the last episode, everything comes together. It's brilliant work here. If anything, this is the one series on Netflix that you have to watch. Even if you don't like Edgar Allan Poe, if you've never watched a Flanagan piece before in your life, watch this one. Everyone gives a phenomenal performance. You even see a different side to Mark Hamill, which I was completely blown away by. He was fantastic in this. This is a five out of five for me for Mike Flanagan. I was blown away. Let me know what your ranking of the Mike Flanagan series are on Netflix. I would probably do The Fall of the House of Usher, the Haunting of Hill House, Haunting of Bly Manor, Midnight Mass, and then the Midnight Club. Unfortunately, it is down there, but the Fall of the House of Usher, an absolute perfect piece of work. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. You can always follow me over at AMX End Day Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. And if you guys want to help me grow this wonderful channel, you can find out ways to do that in the bio below. I'll catch you guys next time. Keep watching movies.